legislature on the verge of the first expulsion in decades. Thanks for joining us here at 4. I'm Deborah Takahara. And I'm Matt Morrow in for Mike Landis. Today, political reporter Joe St. George joins us live with the latest on this breaking news. Joe. Yeah, Matt and Deb, uh, this uh, vote is imminent. It will be happening within our 4 o'clock newscast. I'm right outside the chamber right now. At this moment, Representative Steve Lebsock is delivering one final pitch to lawmakers to keep his job. Right now, it does not look good. 44 votes are needed to expel him. By our whip count, it appears as though there are enough lawmakers willing to kick him out of his job. It's been an emotional day here. Here's just a portion of what we've experienced. And instead, I spent the night after it happened crying about how could I go home to my five-year-old daughter and not try to change the world for her. So I did go to leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Coloradoans, colleagues, There has been a severe lack of due process since the beginning on November 10th, 2017. And I bought a bulletproof vest. And I'm wearing it. It's right here. I'm wearing Kevlar. Because I fear for retaliation. I'm in the chamber of the House of Representatives and I'm wearing a bulletproof vest. That without question, uh, the most emotional part uh, of today's hearing. Uh, lawmakers saying he's worried about Representative Lebsock and what he might do. He's wearing a bulletproof vest on the floor today. Folks, that's how tense it is. You're looking live now at the Speaker of the House, Crisanta Turan, a representative who represents Denver. Uh, she is the top Democrat here, and what she is doing is preparing to move to a final vote. Again, 44 votes are needed, and after the, when we started this day, when we began this day, we anticipated that perhaps this vote might go down, that Representative Lovesock might stay, but because of that emotional testimony that you heard today, it appears as though enough lawmakers are prepared to take the most serious step they can do. It hasn't been done since 1915 in Colorado and expel a fellow lawmaker. Again, Matt and Deb, this vote is imminent. We're going to hang right here. As soon as we know what's going on, uh, we're going to pop back in. Uh, but right now, it doesn't look good for Representative Lebsock preparing to be kicked out of the General Assembly for sexual harassment allegations. Guys, back to you. Some emotional and powerful testimony there. Joe, before you go very quickly, how long is it going to be until this vote? Any definitive idea? And what happens if Representative Lebsock is expelled? Well, Matt, I think this vote's going to happen within the next few minutes, uh, certainly before 415. At least that's based off my experience where we're at with this thing. If Lebsock is expelled, it will be up to a select committee in his district to appoint his successor. Um, he, I am told that if he is voted out, that security will escort him out of the chambers. And you heard that, you heard that moment about wearing a bulletproof vest. Representative Lebsock a short time ago did respond to that, saying he would never harm any of his colleagues, that he's an honorably discharged Marine and he would protect them, never hurt them. Needless to say, high drama at the state capitol. This has, this has not been seen in quite some time, Matt. All right, Joe, we will check back with it in a few minutes when that vote happens. And breaking right now, a court hearing going on involving a Mennonite woman who is refusing to testify for the prosecution in a death penalty case because it is against her religion. You're looking live at the courtroom right now, the hearing going on at this hour. Greta Lindekrantz is a defense investigator and has been in jail since Monday. She says helping the prosecutors execute a defendant would violate her religious beliefs, although her lawyer says she is willing to testify the court is questioning why it cannot be to a prosecutor. The distinction is whether or not she is being called by those who are seeking to use her to execute another human being. Linda Krantz has refused to answer questions about her work on the defense team of Robert Ray, one of three men on Colorado's death row right now. Our Vicente Arenas is in the courtroom and will bring us updates on Channel 2 and on our news partners, Fox 31. 
A gunfire leads to a lockdown for a Commerce City neighborhood. Scary moments this morning. This happened just after 11 in the River Rock Park neighborhood. We're told police were called for a well-being check on a man inside this home. But while an officer approached that house, someone fired a shot. It's still unclear exactly who fired it, but we do know injuries have been reported. Right now, we're working to get more details about that incident. Happening right now, Aurora police need your help identifying a vehicle involved in a hit and run crash that left a young girl with serious injuries. Channel 2's Kevin Torres is live outside Children's Hospital where that girl is still recovering. Kevin. Good afternoon, Deb. That little girl was 11 years old at the time, but has since turned 12. This all happened on February 8th, but Aurora police just released new surveillance footage showing what they believe to be the vehicle. Now, this is a photo of that vehicle. Aurora police believe it's either a mid to late 90s Toyota Camry or possibly a Nissan Sentra, also from the mid to late 90s. Investigators say it likely has front end damage to it as well. The accident happened along Mississippi and Uvalda. The little girl tried crossing Mississippi when that vehicle traveling westbound hit her and fled. The girl's mother and Plenty of witnesses saw it all happen. Even my daughter, she asked me, so who hit me? So we don't know. So somebody can hit you and run. So it breaks our heart whenever we have a hit and run, and then especially when it's a young child. Anyone with information is asked to call Crime Stoppers. You can be eligible for up to a $2,000 reward. That number is 720-913-STOP. Now, I was speaking with that little girl's father, and he said that she is doing well. Again, she turned 12 years old on Valentine's Day, her birthday. Reporting live at Aurora, I'm Kevin Torres, Channel 2 News. Yeah, we hope they catch someone in that case. Thanks, Kevin. And here is a live look outside at a gorgeous afternoon. It was a warm one out there today, wasn't Incredibly it? Incredibly nice for the uh, beginning of March here. Matt Makins is out on the weather deck, and Matt... You're lucky if you had to work today. We have this weekend. It's going to be great as well. It certainly will be. It's beautiful out here right now. I wish I had a picture of uh, Margaret. I mean, uh, water. Water would be great right now. Good old big cold pitcher of that water. Uh, temperatures are going to be nice for the rest of this afternoon, but the wind is a bit of a drawback. You can feel that breeze certainly here downtown. It's stronger elsewhere. We'll start off with the wind gusts around the state. Basically, everyone has strong winds out there, but it's not blowing in any sort of system just yet. Our skies are still mostly clear. Temperature-wise, soaring into the 70s over the southeastern plains. Denver is hovering very close to 70. In the high country, that's simply too warm for ski season. 40s and 50s there, so we're having uh, spring skiing conditions, that's for sure. Around the front range, lots of 60s over the eastern plains and the metro areas, and of course, the warmth there in the high country. Your planning forecast this evening, we cool off barely into the middle 30s. Early tomorrow through the midday into the afternoon, all of which you should enjoy the sunshine and the warmth. Temperatures get right back into those 60s tomorrow afternoon and some low 70s. Wind will be a bit of a drawback tomorrow. We're still tracking that system, bringing some snowfall on Sunday. We'll take a look at future cast and plan your weekend hour by hour with that coming up in just a little bit. All right, looking forward to it. Thank you, Matt. Well, President Donald Trump's surprise announcement about adding a 25% tariff on all steel imports could have a big effect right here in Denver. The president made that announcement last night at a meeting with steel industry executives, and the effects of it could soon be felt all over, especially here where downtown is in a building boom. Everywhere you look, from up in the air to down the road in your rush hour drive, steel is all around us, especially in the tall big buildings going up in downtown Denver. It is a huge part of what we do for sure. It's it's everywhere. Steve Rogers is talking about construction. He's the president of 8020 Builders and has been in building for more than 25 years. The biggest issue we're dealing with in the industry right now is the volatility in pricing and in fact most specifically the increase in pricing. Steel has been increasing in price since the recession. In fact, the World Steel Association predicts it'll increase by another 5% in the U.S. this year, and that was before President Trump met with industry executives Thursday night. We're going to build our steel industry back. The president wants to do that with a 25% tariff on all imported steel, which makes up about a third of all the steel used in the U.S. When the pricing is as volatile as it's been, and not just in the steel industry, but in the entire market, it becomes very difficult. Somebody ends up proverbially holding the bag. Rogers and others in the construction Construction industry say, despite the building boom, budgets are tight, not only because of the high cost of steel, labor, lumber, and more, but because of the instability of their prices. They don't think the tariff will affect any of these construction projects right now, but it could mean more expensive apartments, restaurants, and offices down the road. 
and they're now in a wait and see approach. Meanwhile, a fire in Bennett makes for quite the response. Take a look at this. South Metro Fire says it took Bennett Fire and get this, nine other districts to extinguish a house fire just south of I-70 off County Road 129. Crews say one person was transported with minor smoke inhalation. No one else was hurt and no word yet on what sparked that fire. The Reverend Billy Graham honored at a funeral service today in Charlotte, North Carolina. Hundreds of people there to pay tribute to the beloved evangelist, including President Trump and Vice President Mike Pence. The private funeral service was held on the grounds of Graham's library. The service caps more than a week of public tributes. Graham died at his home in the uh, North Carolina area last Wednesday at the age of 99. Thank you for um, your kindness to my father. Uh, he would say this is too much about Billy Graham. He wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't be happy. Uh, he wanted to be more about the Lord Jesus Christ. On Wednesday and Thursday, a rare honor was awarded to Graham. He lay in honor inside the U.S. Capitol Rotunda after a service was attended by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, House Speaker Paul Ryan, Vice President Mike Pence, and President Trump. This goes to show how many people's lives he touched. Mm -hmm. Well, spring sports season will soon begin for many Colorado children, and with that comes awareness for parents with concussions. After the break, Consumer Reports details what parents need to know about concussions, plus what to do if your child gets one. Here's a look at today's Colorado question of the day. It is the first one of these in the nation was issued for a car in Denver in 1908. What do you think it is? Share your guess on the KWGN Facebook page and we could put it on the air. Only one forecast. Way, temperatures will plummet into the single digits tonight. It is independently certified. We're looking at six inches of snowfall for Littleton, eight for Lakewood. Colorado's most dangerous. Snow, but blizzard conditions in the mountains tomorrow. Pinpoint weather on Channel 2 News. This is Colorado's own Channel 2 News at 4. I'm Joe St. George uh, here at the Colorado State Capitol where for the first time since 1915 a state lawmaker has been expelled. That vote taking place here on the House floor uh, just a short time ago. We'll pan in here for you again. This is a live look of the House floor. Representative Steve Lebsock who was accused back in November of sexual harassment. Uh, it was a four month ordeal involving a fellow lawmaker involving other individuals who work around the Colorado Capitol. This debate began at 9 a.m. this morning on the floor. We heard from multiple parties. We heard from Representative Lebsock. We did not know how this vote would go down at the beginning of today, but we now know uh, that Representative Lebsock is no longer a Representative Lebsock. He's just Steve Lebsock, expelled, kicked out of the General Assembly. So think about this, Matt and Deb, for a moment. What a message this sends in this hashtag MeToo movement, in this era um, of, um, of renewed focus on sexual sexual harassment in the workplace. We now have a Colorado lawmaker that was kicked out of his position, his elected position, by fellow lawmakers. Uh, just a remarkable scene here at the state capitol, Matt and Deb. All right, remarkable indeed. By the way, you can get the latest on that at our website, kwgn.com. Now on a very different note, there are so many benefits associated with kids playing sports, but as the spring season gets underway, parents also need to be aware of the dangers of concussions. Concussions are a common type of sports injury, and while they're not usually life-threatening, they can still be serious. Natalie Tisdall teamed up with, with Consumer Reports and tells us what to look out for and what to do if your child gets hurt. 15-year-old Emily Penner is thrilled to be playing basketball again. Emily got a serious concussion during a practice in February of 2016, and she went through months of physical therapy before fully regaining her balance. Her mother still gets emotional thinking about the long and difficult road to recovery. And as a mom, you're, you just you want to do everything for your child, but there's, there's nothing you can do. You know, there's really nothing you can do to help. Parents may feel helpless, but Consumer Reports says there are some things you can do, starting with prevention. Talk to the coach, you know, have a conversation about player safety, you know, ask what coaches are doing. Um, ask what they're thinking about concussion prevention. Neurologist and Consumer Reports Medical Director Orly Avitzer says it's important to take any blow to the head seriously. If you think your child has had a concussion, pull them out of the game. You don't want them to return to play on the same day as a concussion, even if you think their symptoms have resolved. 
Symptoms can come about quickly or be delayed a day or two. Look out for things like nausea, headache, confusion, dizziness, and memory problems. After a lot of rest and rehabilitation, Emily has fully recovered, but treatment depends on the extent of the injury. And while most symptoms resolve within a week or two, as Emily discovered, don't be surprised if they linger. Natalie Tisdall, Channel 2 News. And you should be sure your child has medical clearance before going back to sports after a concussion. A rest is really important, but current thinking suggests it's also okay to have some gentle physical activity like walking in the first few days after a concussion if your child is up to it. All right, taking a live look outside. A lot of kids probably playing some sports in the park on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Matt Makins is back and you forgot the margaritas. The pitcher of water, you mean? Oh, right. Ice cold water. That's you what drank we drink it all, around, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> no, what do you mean by that? Uh, let's take a look. Uh, here's a different vantage point of the city. With that last camera was Lookout Mountain. We're going to take a look at uh, Sky 2 flying over the Capitol building. Obviously, drama there today. Right now, 67 degrees downtown, 69 out at the airport. The wind is still breezy, and that will be a factor for your evening and also portions of your weekend. Mostly clear at 6 o'clock, though, 60 degrees. Even 10 o'clock, still warm, will be in the middle 40s. A great night to enjoy the outdoors if you can. Maybe light jacket weather past sunset, but overall pretty nice. Future cast, I got it set up to show you the windy areas again, kind of pinpointing the uh, brightest Hottest colors here will be the strongest wind gusts. What's over the eastern plains will weaken from time to time tonight, but it does come back tomorrow. It'll focus on the Palmer Divide and the mountainous areas tomorrow. Denver downtown, not necessarily a bad wind, just notable from time to time. So Deb really loved uh, the hair cast, so we'll show it to you again. Windy again tomorrow. Go to Deb's Twitter page. She had fun with that uh, graphic earlier this morning. Future cast, visible weather. Nothing for the next 24 hours, so I'll just skip on by it. Sunday, a chance of snowfall, but it's going to stay in the high country. We'll take a look at that just in a moment. Let's get through your temperatures tonight, though. Middle 20s in the high country, 30s over the plains in most cases. Some upper 20s also. Denver stops at 33. Very warm start to your day at 7 a.m. 36 by 10, 52. Noon, we're at... 60 degrees and we'll stay in those middle to upper 60s throughout the afternoon and I think Denver Fort Collins Greeley will likely hit 70 degrees for the official high in the afternoon look at the middle 70s over the eastern plains very warm but it is windy and very dry 67 degrees for Castle Rock 40s and 50s for highs in the mountains 58 for Eagle 52 Steamboat Springs Vail 50, Aspen 50, simply too warm for the resort towns, melting off that precious snowpack we have, but we'll add to it again on Sunday. So Saturday's your wind day, temperatures near 70, and you must also be careful of the fire danger. Fire weather watch is in effect for the Palmer Divide. I posted safety tips, what that means on my Facebook page for you. Sunday, 55 degrees, so a good little cool off there. A very slight chance of some snowfall, maybe coming into Monday morning. As far as the accumulation of that snowfall, well, here's the map. We'll make it bigger here, mostly in the high country, surrounding the flat tops. That's going to be 3 to 6 and maybe even pushing 6 to 12. Vail to Crested Butte around Aspen, 3 to 6 or so. But notice how that quickly dries up. You move over the mountains and get into the foothills, maybe a little bit of snowfall, but up and down I-25 in the vast majority of the metro areas. Don't expect to see much for Sunday. Here's a look at the mountain planner. If you love sk spring skiing, go tomorrow. Travel's good. Sunshine. Then Sunday, if you like a little bit of fresh snow, that's going to be your day. Most of next week, quiet with 20s and 30s. Thank you so much, Matt. We have breaking news from an apartment complex in Wheat Ridge. A person has died after a fire. Our Greg Viedo is live on the scene with the very latest. Greg, any idea what happened out there? Yeah, not at this point, guys. I'll give you kind of a closer look at what firefighters with West Metro uh, Fire Authority are uh, dealing with here, or fire rescue, I should say. Uh, the uh, unit in question, the one there at the end, you see a, a police officer as well as an investigator, some yellow tape around that unit. At about 2.40, West Metro gets the initial call of a, uh, a fire. The, the uh, call was actually an automated one from the alarm system. They arrive here on scene, unfortunately find out that uh, one person, a male, had passed away. These ladies over here, here, live across the street. They actually know the folks who uh, live inside the, that unit. They say the uh, second individual is uh, one that uh, was not here at the time, but unfortunately the bad news is uh, one uh, individual has uh, passed away here uh, after uh, this uh, fire in the uh, Wheat Ridge area. We're on the Wheat Ridge, a Lakewood border. Uh, the cause of the fire does remain under investigation. As soon as we get more, we'll be sure and let you know. Live here in Wheat Ridge, Greg Nieto, Colorado Zone, Channel 2. All right, thanks, Greg. All right, still ahead on Channel 2 News at 4. 
for a comeback story that will no doubt touch your heart. How this woman went from being on the streets to having her very own home. And right now on KWGN.com, the two presenters who flubbed the Best Picture reveal last year at the Oscars will be back this year. Read all about it on our website. The Pinpoint Weather Team on Channel 2 News. We are all aware of the homeless problem in the Denver area, but you seldom hear about the success stories, those who have left the streets for a better life. Well, we have one of those stories for you right now. The local organization is helping break that vicious cycle one woman at a time. Channel 2's Ernie Bjorkman spoke with her. I was urinated on, I was egged. <laughs> and almost killed. Meet 63-year-old Vicki. She had been chronically homeless for more than five years. A well-educated woman who worked for a Denver bank for 23 years. But the job ended and no money saved. I found myself getting, you know, harder and harder to pay the rent and keep up my car and everything. And I just, I don't really know what happened. At the age of 58, she was homeless. Over the bridge, under the bridge, behind churches, um, in vacant buildings, you know, I, it was, and I was devastated. Vicki eventually found a ladder to climb her way out of the hole. It's called the Irving Street Women's Residence, run by the Volunteers of America. Bottom line here is the women here are not forced here. They want to come and try and help themselves. Absolutely. Uh, all of our women here want to have that future that, you know, that they had in the past or want to have that life that they can, you know, really thrive in. None of our women, you know, really enjoyed their experience on the street. Uh, they want something better for themselves. The facility can house up to 25 women. Most have their own rooms. So, Angel, this is a typical room here at the residence. Yes, it is. So, this so is a one of our residence rooms now, uh -huh. and uh, she's been here for uh, a little while, and Vicki had a room just like this. The women get mental and life skill help 24-7. They share in the duties and eventually learn to live on their own. Vicki, waiting for more than a year, finally moved into a subsidized apartment two weeks ago. She misses her family at the facility. I loved all of them. But you're glad you're not here anymore. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, good. Well, congratulations. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you very much. Thank Best you. of luck for Thank you. Always. Thank you. We are following breaking news from the state capitol where for the first time in more than 100 years, a legislator has been expelled. We have the very latest information from Joe St. George live with the reaction to this historic vote. This is Colorado's own Channel 2 News at 4.30. And we're following breaking news at 4.30. Representative Steve Ledsock is no longer a representative. Just minutes ago, he was expelled from the legislature here in Colorado. And this comes after a powerful day, a very emotional testimony from Ledsock as well as his accuser, Faith Winters. And uh, our Joe St. George was in the State House as this happened just a moments ago. Again, Representative Ledsock expelled from the legislature this afternoon. Take a listen. All those women that didn't know if their voices were heard, all the women in this building that didn't know if they could be treated for their minds and their ideas and their policy ideas, you won today. Your voices matter. Day there, a committee for a special election will decide who will replace Representative Lebsock. Now, again, Joe St. George is live there. We'll get to him at the latest. You can also find more at kwgn.com. We'll continue to follow that. Also, breaking a court hearing ends without a decision for a Mennonite woman who is refusing to testify for the prosecution in a death penalty case because it is against her religion. This is a different video. There's the video of Linda, Greta Linda Krantz, is a defense attorney or defense investigator and has been in jail since Monday. She says helping the prosecutors execute a defendant would violate her religious beliefs. Although her lawyer says she is willing to testify, the court is questioning why it cannot be to a prosecutor. Thanks for staying with us here at 4.30. I'm Deborah Takahara. And I'm Matt Morrow. Take a look at this. This cell phone video shows what's happening in Boston right now. You don't want to be there. It's massive flooding as a nor'easter pounds that region. Yeah, vicious storm hammering the east coast. It's being called a bomb cyclone. 
Strong, bringing hurricane force winds, severe flooding, even some snow. Aristea Brady in the newsroom with the latest details. Aristea? Yeah, Deb, this storm having an impact on flights in and out of Denver International Airport. There have been more than 20 flights canceled because of the storm. We understand dozens of delays, not to mention it is definitely a site right now in the Northeast. Floodwaters cover train tracks in New Jersey. Boston Harbor spills into the streets. Power outages multiply as these furious winds just seem to persist. They won't let up. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has get residents to asked residents, we should say, to stay off the roads as the state grapples with heavy snow to the north, floods to the south. About 80 million people in this storm's path, with 22 million under coastal flood warnings. Authorities warning residents in the most populated coastal areas the worst could be yet to come. The big message here is not to go back to your home and get complacent and think you want to stay in your home tonight because tonight's tide is going to be the worst of this. We expect widespread damage to our coastal front homes. Now in Washington, trees just crashing down right at the U.S. Capitol, the Naval Observatory, also other places. There are power outages just all across the East Coast. Many people bracing for a wet, windy, cold, and dark night. In the newsroom, Aristea Brady, Channel 2 News. Aristea and meteorologist Matt Makins here now with me. And what does that storm look like right now? Still very windy. That's the biggest impact. And as the tide is will be high tonight, that's when the wind will obviously cause the biggest issues. But here's what it looks like, kind of the bird's eye view, if you will, of the storm system. There is rain and snow with it, so don't get me wrong. There is that wet impact. But the center of the storm system, watch how quickly on feature cast here, that that center of the storm moves away from the coastal areas, pulling most of that moisture away, the rain and the snow. However, wind will continue in the same areas. It's classic nor'easter here. Winds from the northeast really pummeling the coastline. So Boston on up to Portland, Maine, New York City, down to Philly. All of those areas will be feeling strong wind gusts, but it's going to be around the Cape uh, and also Boston that will have the biggest impact as far as the tidal surge and that wind tonight. Additional snowfall, we're not talking about a lot, three or four inches, but again, the center of that storm system is impressive. It's kind of pummeling the northeastern coast uh, clearly has been doing so, and it's really starting to move up to around Boston. Also, look for video out of Boston as we go throughout this evening. That'll be a big impactor heading into their, their weekend. All right, thanks, Matt. It was an honor you don't typically see from CDOT, but one that served as an important reminder, a procession for a fallen worker who was killed on the job. Channel 2's Drew Engelbart was there. Nolan Olson worked for Colorado's Transportation Department for 14 years. On Friday, CDOT honored their fallen worker with a 276-mile procession from the metro area to Olson's hometown in Pagosa Springs. He was really a great man. He was a family man. Um, he was humorous. He, you know, was really dedicated to his job here at CDOT. Olson was killed after being hit by a car while filling potholes in Pagosa Springs last month. A CDOT typically doesn't organize a procession, but they hope this one served as an example for drivers to slow down and move over. We may be on the road all the time, and I think that, you know, you sometimes become immune with the construction and work zones, um, but there's actual people behind those cones that have families that and friends that they want to go home to. The show of support from fellow crews was evident, but even more was the support shown by passersby, saluting those who work on our roads. Well, hearing the support um, and seeing everything coming through social media just means so much and it shows that you know we are actually a value to uh, the state. Drew Engelbart, Channel 2 News. Can't say it enough, slow down and move over. Well, whether you're new to Colorado or have been here for many years, you've probably seen them off I-70 near Genesee, a beautiful sight, a herd of bison just happily grazing away. And today, you could have taken one home if you were a high bidder at the annual bison auction. Channel 2's Dan Drew was there and tells us all about it now. Oh, give me a home what you're looking at is history. Direct descendants from the wild bison herd in Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. The city and county of Denver, you know, they wanted to preserve a piece of the American Wild West. So in 1914, wild bison from Yellowstone National Park would call Genesee, Colorado home. The bison population right now is thriving. So much so that every year they have to auction off some of the calves. You no, know, we don't want to overgraze the pastures, you know, we want to be good stewards of the land. Ranchers from around Colorado and beyond are here to bid and buy the bison calves. 
32 in all. We're trying to get new blood in the in our herd, so we're, we're going to try and buy some bulls today. So what does one do with a bison? Well, you eat them. What else you do with them? That's a good, that's a good answer. We don't milk them. So you, uh, yeah, especially if they're males. After about an hour, it was all over. And soon the baby bison will be off to their new homes. I do hate to see him go. Gone, but not forgotten. Well, maybe forgotten. Dan DeRue, Channel 2 News. Can you keep them as a pet? Yes, you don't them. have to necessarily <laughs> eat them. It'd be a pretty big pet to have, though, in its own room. Stick around. We have the answer to your Colorado-themed question of the day in just minutes. Plus a long journey for a Denver musician who lost the ability to make music, only to find it again in a very inspirational way. Kevin Torres will have this story unique to Colorado. A musician from Denver forced to stop playing the music he loved due to a disease is back at it now. But as you can imagine, the road to get there was not easy. And a story that's unique to Colorado, Kevin Torres tells us what's inspired him. I started playing guitar um, when I was around 12 or 13. Ever since he was a boy, Brian Borgo dreamt of creating music. You know, it was the 80s. I was playing. Motley Crue, Rat, you know, Scorpions, <laughs> that kind of stuff. A dream inspired by his father. My father played in, in a rock band the whole time I was growing up. He played guitar and sang. That ultimately became reality later in life. I opened Curtis Park Music um, on 27th and Larimer. A life that would soon change. Right after I opened the store is when I started experiencing weakness in my hands. And that progressed over the next three to four years to the point where I couldn't play guitar anymore. Brian was diagnosed with an untreatable progressive neurological disease. I couldn't play and I was a little depressed and um, I decided again that I had to move on from music. One that took the ability for him to properly function his hands and right foot, slowly spreading to the rest of his body. So I'm slowly becoming paralyzed from the extremities up. Brian had to sell his business and give up music. He couldn't play his guitar anymore. And then this happened. My father, um, he got diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in March of 2017. That moment played a big role in re-inspiring Brian. So I decided I need to use this time to get back into music. And I do it standing up because I can't, um, I have a hard time like moving. I got to use both of my hands to work the mouse. So I had to figure out a way to create music without being able to play any instruments. So, I'm, so I got to use both hands on the mouse. For 10 hours a day, he stands in front of his computer. Kind of like working out. <laughs> this is my workout. Creating computer generated music, which he then has talented musicians help him create. He produced a new album called Be Kind, debuting in April. It's his first album in a decade. His dad was able to hear him play again before he passed away this past January. You can have something taken away from you, but if you want it bad enough, you can find a way to get it back. A message of hope from a fellow who found it. I was given a gift in a way. I had to discover that gift through suffering and through loss. In Denver, this is Kevin Torres, Channel 2 News. Glad he's back at it. Yeah, no doubt. Well, coming up next on Channel 2 News at 4, an eatery that is once again in some hot water. You guys had nine critical violations in January, and this is the second time that you guys score enough on our restaurant report card. So what landed this restaurant in trouble again? We'll explain right after the break. It's time for one of our most popular segments, Restaurant Report Card. It's time where we dig deep into restaurant health inspections to see who's making the grade and who has some work to do. Here's Erica Gonzalez. It's called Neater's Bakery and Cafe, but what inspectors found, it's clear they need some food safety training. The Arvada location fills our report card with 11 critical health code violations last month and August of last year. The critical mistakes include employees putting gloves on without washing their hands and changing tasks but not changing gloves. A worker was touching cakes with their bare hands, and a pest box was stored on top of boxes used for cakes and catering. A corporate sent the following comment that says in part, Neater's Bakery and Cafe of Arvada has taken immediate action based on the evaluation which was given during our health department inspections. We are committed to the highest level of food safety and customer service. Next, we take a look at a repeat offender. 
Blue Bay Asian Cafe. A Denver inspector cited the restaurant for nine critical violations in January and ordered the owner to clean the coolers, floor, walls, and ceiling. The sanitizing solution measured zero. Soda syrup was stored on the floor, and fried chicken, wontons, and cut cabbage were all held at the wrong temperature. The restaurant did not return our calls, so we stopped by. I just want to know what you guys are doing to make sure that things are safe in the kitchen, that you've corrected the violations that the inspector found. What are you guys doing? Always uh, do a very good, very clean. And finally, our A of the Week goes to Olive Garden in Lakewood for two perfect inspections in a row. We do not compromise our standards from training to execution on a daily and even hourly up to the minute and and so I, I'm very proud to work with a team that has the knowledge and the tools and lead that team for our passion for food safety and excellence thereof. And how does it feel to get an A on our report card? Thrilled. Absolutely thrilled. We love the show. The team is talking about it. If you think a restaurant needs to be inspected, just call the health department in the county where that restaurant is located and they will take a look. We also have links to the inspections and the health departments posted on our website, kwgn.com. Just click on the news tab and restaurant report card. Erica Gonzalez, Channel 2 News. Now, Colorado's most accurate forecast with meteorologist Matt Makins. Tomorrow is going to be a great day to be outdoors. It's going to look just like this. Bacchus and Schenker Sky Kim sitting at Lookout Mount looking over the city. We'll have blue skies again tomorrow, but sadly the wind will be a deterrent for some of your plans. Right now the wind is strong in just about every location across the map, and it will be again tomorrow. Deborah posted that this morning, <laughs> making fun of the hair cast graphic. I think you wore it better, Debbie. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, very nice, very nice. She'll look just like that again tomorrow, too, with a win. Evening planner for tonight. Windy at times at 8 o'clock and 50 degrees, 44 by 10. Very warm this evening. In fact, Denver only cools off to about 30 in total tonight. Middle 30s over the southeastern plains. Teens barely in some of the mountainous sections. Most will stop in the mid-20s. Very warm. And the visible weather for the next 24 hours or so. For the front range, very quiet. We'll have a little bit of cloud cover skirting northeastern Colorado. And as we go throughout the day tomorrow, I'm watching a storm system that's sitting off into Utah, Idaho, and portions of West Western Wyoming, but for the state of Colorado, that will not appear tomorrow. It moves through Sunday, and that's the mountain snow chance and a cool off for Denver. Middle 30s as we start off our Saturday, 57 by 11 o'clock, low to mid 60s for the afternoon hours. And occasionally, some of our car thermometers will hit 70 to 71. That's around Denver. Southeastern corner, though, well into the middle and upper 70s. 50s in the high country, as I pointed out before, that's too warm. We're melting off the snowpack that we need to keep around for the resort's sake. 67 degrees around Loveland tomorrow, 50, uh, 70 degrees for Fort Collins, 71 in Windsor and Millican, Boulder, Superior, middle to upper 60s. The Denver Metro, 71 out by DIA in Stapleton, as well as Aurora and Inglewood, 68 around Inglewood, uh, excuse me, Lakewood, up to about Arvada, and down to the south in Douglas County, middle and upper 60s here as well. If you need an idea for a hike that's somewhat shielded from from the wind, I always suggest Castlewood Canyon. You can get down there and hide away from the wind. It's still going to be a beautiful day for that. So that's one idea for you. Sunday, we're cooler. We're back down to 55, which honestly is still pretty warm for the time of year. 20% chance of snow and raindrops late in the day. And then into Monday, we'll have a temperature of about 44 to start off the work and school week. As far as that snowfall, again, coming in Sunday, most of it's going to stay in the mountains, and the flat tops will be the favored area out of this. Around Steamboat Resort, uh, 3 to 6 possible. Same for around Vale, Beaver Creek, Breckenridge, once you're getting to Keystone, A Basin, Loveland, Winter Park, we're looking at smaller totals than that. So if you're going to be traveling on Sunday to the mountains and the resorts, just know that there could be some slick areas coming back, but notice how you come off of the mountains, you pass Genesee, down into the city, should be smoother sailing. Kind of the maybe a potential area of snowfall here in the city would be at that northwestern corner between Denver and Boulder. Should have bluebird skiing conditions tomorrow. Sunday snowfall in 38 and then for the mountainous areas next week 20s, 30s and then 40s. I'm gonna have a ponytail tomorrow and lots of hairspray. Thank you. I liked your graphic. I thought that was I great. Blown Who wore better, the emoji or Deb? <laughs> I, think Deb I think look. Deb wins. Thank I think, I think we need to have you my in graphics. each one, yes. and we'll just put you on there. Yes. It's your new headshot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Deb.
All right, back to our question of the day now, not about Deb's hair, <laughs> but this. The first one of these in the nation was issued for a car in Denver all the way back in 1908. What do you think it is? Lots of people sharing their guesses today. Leon says the Denver boot. And Nancy says a speeding ticket. Several people getting that right. Uh, the answer, though, is a license plate. You think they had ones on the front of the car and the back of the car back then? Or just Probably one? not. Yeah. No, just the olden days. <laughs> Up next, one last look at today's top story. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And I'm Joe St. George here on the floor of the House chamber where within this Channel 2 News at 4, we've seen history. A lawmaker expelled from the General Assembly over accusations of sexual harassment. A major news story. They needed 44 votes to do it. They got over 50 votes, again, to expel Representative Steve Lebsock. We have uh, seen and, and talked to him and heard his story for months. This story first broke in November. A short time ago, I'm just going to pull, uh, pull over here, grab my iPad, real, uh, iPhone real quick. Governor Hickenlooper released a statement a short time ago saying, today's vote by Colorado's House of Representatives was important and necessary to address well-documented instances of sexual harassment in the workplace. This has been a painful chapter, and it is our sincere hope that we will all learn from the bravery of the woman who came forward. Again, a clear message from lawmakers today that they believe Representative Faith Winter, who was the lawmaker who brought forth the f first allegation, as well as four other individuals who filed sexual harassment complaints against Representative Steve Lebsock. We'll have uh, coverage of this all night long. We'll be popping on our news partner, Fox 31 News at 5. You'll hear from Representative Steve Lebsock. He was tearful. He was crying, uh, Matt and Deb, as he addressed the General Assembly one last time, guys. Joe, this was a very emotional day all around. Can you tell us a little bit about the testimony you heard? <coughs> Well, it was just, you know, we started the day, Deb, and we didn't know how this was going to go. In fact, the people I talked to thought Lebsock would stay in office, that he would win this vote. Um, but throughout the day, you heard emotional testimony, people saying they were victims of sexual harassment, victims of sexual assault. One lawmaker actually came up and said he's worried for his safety involving Representative Steve Lebsock and says he's wearing a bulletproof vest on the floor of the State House. Think about that, as that's how tense, how emotion, emotional today's proceedings took place. So uh, full of emotion, full of history. Again, this hasn't happened since 1915, Deb and Matt. All right, you said it best, Joe. Historic. Again, more on that on Fox 31 in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, one last check of the forecast. How long is this warm weather going to stick around? We've got a nice weekend ahead. It's got a little bit of something for everybody. If you want to golf, I'm sure they'll be popular. Mm -hmm. The golf courses that is for tomorrow. And then Sunday, you could ski with some fresh snowfall. Notice no big temperature hits coming our way. No big snowstorms. So take this Sunday because uh, it's valuable, obviously. We're in uh, every snowflake you can. Yes, and, if and preserve it if you are able to. <laughs> yes, yeah. so warm up there in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, Good it sure thing. is. Uh, spring, ki spring skiing conditions have arrived pretty early this year. So. A lot of melting. A lot of. Yeah, thanks, Matt. We're back tonight for Channel 2 News at 7. Have a great evening. We'll see you then.